Hello, and in this video, we're gonna take a look at the steps you can take to avoid and eliminate feedback at a gig. So, let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to Jasp Tech Audio, a YouTube channel dedicated to helping musicians with their live sound. My name's Craig Jasper, I've been a sound engineer for 20 years, I'm also a gigging guitarist and a music teacher. This channel aims to teach you everything you need to know about getting the best out of your PA equipment and getting the best live sound you possibly can. So, click and subscribe and we'll see you in the video. So, if we're performing in larger music venues with an in-house PA system and a sound engineer, then feedback through our outfront speakers is generally something we don't have to worry about. And if it does happen, well, it's looked after by the sound engineer. However, if we're having to set our own equipment up in the venues that we play and take our own PA equipment and do our own sound, then feedback is quite often something we have to deal with. Now before we get any further into this video, let's just remind ourselves of what feedback is. So if we look at this diagram, we've got a microphone, we've got a speaker. We will have a sound source going into this microphone, let's say a vocal. Now feedback occurs when the sound source goes into this microphone, makes its way to our speakers, is amplified, and then the microphone picks up that same sound again. That sound will then make its way back to the speakers, where it will be projected, and find its way back to the microphone. Feedback is simply a loop, where the microphone is picking up the sound produced by the speakers over and over again. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at a few steps we can take to eliminate that feedback. So there will be a limit within a PA system that we can reach before feedback occurs. I'm gonna use a diagram to show you what I mean. So I'm gonna draw a graph, and across the bottom, we're gonna have our sound, our bass frequencies, our middle frequencies, and our high frequencies. And up the left-hand side, we'll have our volume. This red line represents our limit before we hit feedback. This blue line, for now, is going to represent our sound. We want to be able to turn our sound up to our desired volume for our gig before we reach this feedback limit. If we hit that limit of feedback, then we're gonna hear those squeaky sounds, that horrible sound that we wanna try and avoid. There are certain things that we can do that will increase this threshold before feedback. If we're doing certain things in, in an incorrect way, then this threshold will be lower and we won't be able to get as much volume out of our system before we start reaching feedback. In this video, we're gonna look at a few things that we can do to try and increase our feedback threshold and avoid feedback from happening in the first place. And then we'll have a look at a few things we can do to eliminate feedback should it still occur. So the things we're gonna look at are speaker placement, correct microphone technique, setting our input gain correctly, avoiding mistakes with our EQ, and then eliminating troublesome frequencies should we still get some feedback problems. So, let's take a look at speaker placement. Now, ideally, we wanna set our speakers up as far forward as our microphones as possible and facing away from our microphones. The further away our speakers are from our microphones, the less chance there is of that microphone picking up sound from the speaker, therefore eliminating a lot of feedback problems. However, it's not always realistic to have our speakers so far forward of the stage, and sometimes we have to set up in a situation where the speakers need to be on stage with us. If that's the case, always try and still set up with your speakers aiming away from your microphone, never pointed at your microphone, and never set up behind you. If you're setting up your PA system with your speakers behind you because you want to be able to hear yourself through those speakers, chances are you may be getting a lot of feedback problems. Those speakers are not there for you as the performer to hear. If you want to be able to hear yourself on stage, you need to get a monitor, which is a shaped speaker which goes on the floor and it aims at you so you can hear yourself. We are going to look at monitors in a future video, what they are, how to plug them in and how to set them up. We also wanna make sure that we're not angling our speakers in. If we're angling our speakers inwards, then the dispersion angle, that, that's the angle in which our speakers project sound, may be projecting some of that sound back towards the microphone and therefore creating feedback problems. So in terms of speaker placement, we want our speakers in front of the microphone and aiming away from our microphone. That may prevent quite a lot of feedback issues right at the start to begin with before we try anything else. Now let's have a look at microphone technique. So using correct microphone technique can actually solve us a lot of issues. A dynamic vocal microphone such as an SM58 like this one is designed to be used relatively close to our mouths. We shouldn't have it that far away. Let's have a look at another diagram to demonstrate what I mean. If we hold the microphone close to our mouths, it is getting a really strong signal from our voice. Our voice is gonna be loudest closer to our mouth. 
If we hold the microphone further away from our mouth, then the volume of our voice is going to have diminished somewhat before the microphone picks it up. Let me show you what I mean. So at the minute you can hear me through this lapel mic that I'm wearing. I'm going to turn this off and talk directly into this microphone. So this is the sound coming directly from this SM58. I'm holding it quite close to my mouth, just a couple of inches, roughly two fingers distance from my mouth. And as I'm speaking now, I'm going to just move the microphone further away. So the further away the microphone gets, you can see that my voice is now a lot quieter. The closer I am, the louder it is. And I know that's quite obvious, but just listen to that difference in volume. So I'm going to keep talking, keep talking, and there we go. Look how much quieter that is. So, I'm going to turn my lapel microphone back on now. Okay, so you heard how much quieter my voice was when the microphone was that much further away. Now this diagram we looked at earlier showed that our speakers will project our sound forwards and away from us. And that's true, that does happen. However, what this diagram doesn't show is the amount of sound that gets bounced and reflected around our venue. Now the amount of sound that gets reflected and refracted and bounced around our venue and the place that we're playing will depend on a lot of things, such as the materials that are in that room, the furniture that's in there, the amount of people that's in there, but the sound will definitely bounce around and some of that sound will end up coming back onto stage. And if we're holding our microphone further away, well, chances are we've then got to turn that microphone up to be able to be heard and get our volume of our, of our vocal, of our voice, up over our mix. And whilst we're turning our microphone up, chances are that microphone is also going to be picking up some of that sound that's reflected from our speakers and therefore cause feedback. So correct microphone technique can help solve a lot of issues straight away, so just by holding it closer to our mouths. The other thing that we should definitely not do is hold the microphone using this part. We should never cover the capsule of the microphone and let me show you why. Again, I'm going to turn my lapel microphone off so you can hear me down here. So I'm talking directly into my microphone now. I'm holding it on this part of the mic, which is where we should hold the microphone. As soon as I start to hold my microphone here and talk down it, you can see it has changed the tonal characteristics of the microphone. It sounds completely different. When we cover this part of the microphone, it's actually changing the way the microphone works, it's changing the way it picks up sound, and it can also induce feedback. Covering the end of a microphone like this, I've turned my lapel mic back on now, covering the end of a microphone like this can actually induce feedback. So just by using the microphone correctly, holding it closer to our mouth and not covering the end, again can solve issues. Now if you're a vocalist or a singer who likes to pull the microphone away when they're hitting really loud notes and, and, and big notes, that's absolutely fine. You can do that to compensate for that change in volume in your voice, but then as you, as you go back to your regular singing voice, you need to hold that microphone back closer to your mouth. That way you've got a much better chance of being able to turn your microphone up to the level that you need before reaching feedback. Now let's have a look at how to set our input gain correctly. And this isn't just a step for avoiding feedback, this is just generally good practice, setting our input gain to the level it should be. Now, for this video, we're going to have a look at how to do this on both an analog and a digital mixer. But we'll have a look at an analog mixer first. Now, there are lots of different types of analog mixer out there by lots of different manufacturers, but they are all set out in pretty much the same way with pretty much the same controls. Now, we're going to concentrate on three different parts of the mixing desk for this. We're going to look at our gain control, which is generally the first control within a channel strip. We're going to look at the PFL button, which is generally a button directly above the channel fader. And we're going to look at the LED meter, which usually monitors the overall output level of this mixing desk. Now, the PFL button stands for pre-fade listen, and when we press that, it will turn this LED meter into an input monitor for just this channel. So if we talk down the microphone and start turning our gain up, we'll see that these lights will start to come on and it'll tell us at what level this input is. And the more we increase our gain, the higher the input level will be. On an analog mixer, we want to try and get our input gain to round about minus three to zero dB. So we're going to keep turning the gain up until we hit that level. Now it's important we set our input gain correctly for a couple of different reasons. If our gain is too low, even with our channel fade all the way up, we might not be able to get enough volume out of this channel uh, that we need to get during our gig. If our gain is too high, then this channel might go into clip and cause distortion, which never sounds good. Now, if we've set that input gain whilst just saying uh, a few words down the microphone, and then we start singing, chances are we're gonna sing a lot louder than we talk into the microphone. So 
during sound check, just hit that PFL button and just have a look to see if we need to turn the gain down a little bit just to compensate for our louder singing voice. Now we've had a look at how to do this on an analog mixer, let's have a look at how to do it on a digital mixer. Now, just like with an analog mixer, there's lots of different types of digital mixers by lots of different manufacturers. However, digital mixers are all a little bit different. They're all set out a little bit different. The controls are all in different places. A digital mixer is basically a computer with faders. So we need to learn how to use the digital mixer that we've got. Now the digital mixer I'm gonna use for this video is the Behringer XR18, and it's the mixer that I gig with. So let's have a little look at how to do it. This is the software that controls the Behringer XR18. And I've got my lapel microphone plugged into this channel here. We're gonna ignore that because I've already got it set. I'm just using this to record my voice. And I've got my SM58 plugged into this channel here. Now, like I've already said, every digital mixer is slightly different, but all the ones that I've worked on have very similar sections. And what we wanna look for to set the input gain is our input section. So I'm gonna click on the channel that I wanna work on, and then I'm gonna go up the top here and choose my input section. And this is my input gain. Now, like I said, when we did an analog mixer, we wanna to aim to get our input to round about minus three to zero dB. But this is different on a digital mixer. This is our scale over here, this is our input meter. And as you can see, it's all minus figures and zero dB is actually at the top. So if we try and set our input gain to zero dB, we're gonna be going into clip, which is not good. On a digital mixer, we wanna to aim to get our input gain to round about minus 18 to minus 12 dB. So in this region here, and a general rule of thumb on a digital mixer, our input gain, we wanna try and set it to where the, the meter starts to turn yellow. Okay, so it'll start off green, then it'll get to yellow, then it'll get into red. So the right input gain is round about where it starts to turn yellow. So I'm gonna talk into my SM58 now, which I'm doing now, and as I'm talking into it, I'm just gonna increase my input gain, one, two, one, two, one, two, and that's round about where I want it to be. That's somewhere between minus 18 and minus 12, and as you can see, it's just about starting turning yellow, on the input gain here. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is turn on my low cut, which is here. The low cut is usually on the input section on a digital mixer, and on a digital mixer, I can choose where that low cut comes in. So at the minute, it's set to 20 hertz. That's really, really low. So I'm just gonna turn this up. I'm gonna set it. I'm gonna set it to around about 110 hertz. Now we can double check that by clicking on our EQ section. And as I click on the EQ, you can see it's applied this roll off of my frequencies from 110 hertz and down. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is EQ and avoiding some EQ mistakes which might lead to potential problems such as feedback. So EQ stands for equalization and it's basically just another gain stage. And there's a few different types of EQ. We're gonna look at the two most common that we find on most mixing desks. That's a channel EQ and a graphic EQ. We'll talk more about a graphic EQ a little bit later in the video. Right now, we're gonna focus on the channel EQ. So a channel EQ will only affect what's being plugged into that particular channel. EQ is basically another gain stage. Now, the gain control we spoke about earlier will turn the gain up for our entire signal. However, with the EQ, it'll only affect the gain for certain frequency bands. This mixing desk here has got three frequency bands. I've got high frequency, mid frequency, and low frequency. So if I turn up my high frequency, I'm essentially turning the gain up on just the high frequencies on this channel. Now that could cause us some problems. I'm gonna use this diagram again to show you what I mean. So remember, this red line at the top represents our limit before feedback. This blue line at the bottom represents our sound. If I turn the high frequencies up on my, on my channel EQ like this, then I'm essentially doing this to my sound. I'm increasing the gain on my high end, on my high frequencies. So as I turn my channel fader up, my high frequencies are most likely going to hit this limit before feedback, before the rest of my signal. Therefore, chances are I'm going to get some feedback from my higher frequencies. Now in my experience, I only ever tend to turn down frequencies on vocal microphones. Vocal microphones are arguably the most feedback prone microphones that you're gonna use on stage. And if we start turning frequencies up, then we could be causing ourselves some potential issues and some feedback problems. I only ever turn frequencies down. That's my preference and it's worked for me all of these years. Now, the first thing that I would do on a vocal microphone, I would remove some bass frequencies. Most vocal microphones, such as an SM58, are capable of picking up some quite low frequencies. However, our voices don't really produce frequencies all that low. So why amplify them? Why keep them in our signal? 
we can turn them down and we can do that either by just turning down the low frequency control on our EQ or if our mixing desk has got a low cut filter, sometimes known as a high pass filter, we can press that button and it'll turn down all the frequencies below a certain amount. The low cut filter symbol looks like this and it will generally have a number written by it. On a digital mixing desk, we can choose the frequency that we cut. We will look at how to EQ vocals for live sound in a future video, but right now we're just gonna leave it there. My personal preference is to only remove what's not needed rather than to add more frequencies. By doing that, we tend to save ourselves a lot of problems when it comes to feedback. Okay, so by now, hopefully, we've done everything we can to improve our limit before feedback, and hopefully we'll be able to turn our microphones up to the level that we need without any feedback occurring. However, that's not always the case, and sometimes we might still get a few frequencies feeding back. So we're gonna look now at how we can use our graphic EQ to remove some of those troublesome frequencies. Let me explain what I mean by that, and we're gonna use this diagram again. So remember, this red line is our limit before feedback. We've done everything we can to maximize this. And up to now, this blue line has represented our sound. But this isn't really very realistic. Sound is not just a linear line. Sound looks more like this. Now, this isn't to scale, but it's gonna serve a purpose in terms of showing you what I'm talking about. If I was to turn up my channel fader and increase the volume of this particular sound, as you can see, some of these frequencies are going to hit my feedback limit before the rest of my sound. So for instance, I've got these two frequencies that have hit my feedback limit. So I might start getting some ringing from my PA system. What I can do is use my graphic EQ to isolate and remove these frequencies. So if I remove these frequencies, they're no longer a problem. I can then turn up my volume that little bit more until I get another frequency start to feed back. I can use my graphic EQ to then isolate that frequency and turn that down. And I can do that a few times until I get to the point where I've got lots of frequencies starting to feed back. I have then really truly found my limit of volume before feedback occurs. Now, we can do this with both analog equipment and digital equipment. I'm gonna show you how to do it using a digital mixer first, just because it makes it a little bit easier to demonstrate on a video how to do this. But I'm gonna show you how we can do this using an analog mixer as well. So let's have a little look at the digital mixer and how to get rid of these frequencies. So we're back on the Behringer XR18 software. I've got my input gain set for my microphone. Now I'm gonna turn this up and see how loud I can get it before we start to get feedback. And as you can hear, I can only turn it up to this level before I start to get some ringing and some feedback. But what if at our gig, this here isn't loud enough and we still can't hear our vocals over our mix without getting that feedback? What can we do about it? Well, that's where our graphic EQ comes in. Now, the great thing about digital mixers, especially modern ones, they have built-in graphic EQs on their outputs. And on the Behringer XR18, to access it, we go over to here. This is our master fader. And then above here, we've got our master processing section, and this here is our EQ. And if I click on it, it loads up this. Now, this is a parametric EQ. We've got a few different types of EQ on a digital mixer, and over here, we can choose. So we're on parametric EQ, we wanna click where it says graphic EQ. And on a graphic EQ, we've got 31 different bands. That means I can adjust 31 different frequencies across the spectrum one by one. Now we don't wanna be turning any of these up. We don't want any of these to be above zero. What we're gonna do is take away the ones that are feeding back. And this is how we find them. Pretty much every digital mixer that I've worked on has got this function, RTA. It stands for Real Time Analyzer. And when we turn this on, it will show us in real time the frequencies that the microphones plugged into this mixer are picking up. So as I turn this up again now, I'm gonna try and get this to feed back. We can see there, this frequency fed back. So if I turn this down on my graphic EQ, I can then turn this up a little bit more. until I get another frequency and I can pull this out. Maybe this one as well. Now this is quite extreme. I've got a PA speaker really close to my microphone and I'm in a really small room in my house. So I can pull these frequencies out and look, straight away I've got more volume. Some low frequencies starting to feed back somewhere. One, two, one, two. So I can pull these out. And straight away, I've now got more volume on my microphone just by pulling out the troublesome frequencies. 
Now it's worth just quickly pointing out that whatever I do on my graphic EQ is going to affect the sound of everything going into my mixing desk. Whatever I do on my channel EQ is only going to affect that particular input or that particular microphone. The graphic EQ will have an impact on everything going into our mixer, including other microphones, other instruments and music playback. But if these frequencies are feeding back to, and stopping us getting the volume that we need, then in the grand scheme of things, pulling them out of the graphic EQ is not going to have too much of a detrimental effect on our overall sound. Okay, so that's all well and good if we've got a digital mixing desk, but what if we've got an analog mixing desk? Well, let's have a look at an analog mixer with a built-in graphic EQ and how we can use that built-in graphic EQ to get rid of those frequencies. Now, an analog mixing desk obviously is not going to have that RTA function that we've just spoken about. So we've got two options when it comes to finding which frequencies are feeding back. We can either use our ears and train our ears to hear which frequencies are feeding back to try and pull them out, or we can use something like an app on our phone. There are lots of free apps out there which give us an RTA function. This particular one is called Octave RTA. Now, there are limitations to it. It does just use the microphone on our phone, but it does give us a really good reference. You can see this responding to my voice now. And if we get a frequency start to feed back, it shows it on here. So let me show you how we can use something like this app in combination with our small uh, graphic EQ on our mixing desk to try and isolate some frequencies that might be feeding back at one of our gigs. Okay, so just like on my digital mixer, I've got my master fader turned up. I'm gonna turn up this channel fader with my SM58 connected and see how far I can get before feedback. So there we go, I can only turn it up to this sort of level. But again, what if I need to get this higher for my gig? Well, we can use the built-in graphic EQ. Now on the digital mixer, I had a 31 band EQ, so I could pull out any of those 31 frequencies. Built-in graphic EQs onto a mixing desk, they don't come with 31 bands. On this one, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So what I do is I find the nearest frequency to the one that's feeding back on my RTA app, and I pull that out. So let's give that a go. So I'm gonna turn this up to get feedback. And you can see we've got that frequency ringing out there. So I'm gonna pull that out on my graphic EQ, and then I'm gonna keep going until I get another one. And there we go, I've been able to get my fader from there up to there at much more volume without feeding back. And again, this is set up in not a very ideal situation. I've got a PA speaker set up in my small room in my house. But that just demonstrates how we can use a small graphic EQ on our mixing desk to try and kill feedback. What we definitely don't want to do with our graphic EQ is boost any frequencies. We don't want to turn any above zero. We especially want to avoid this smiley face configuration where we are simply just boosting all of our bass and high frequencies. If we're turning things up on our graphic EQ above zero, then chances are we're creating ourselves some problems when it comes to feedback. But what if my mixing desk doesn't have a graphic EQ? Well, in that case, we are a little bit more limited on what we can do. Yes, we've got our channel EQ, but again, there's limitations on that. And if we start messing with our channel EQ, it has a much more broader impact on what it's gonna to do to the sound of our input on that particular channel. For instance, if I've got a microphone plugged into this mixing desk, which has no graphic EQ on it, and I can quite clearly hear that I've got some high frequencies feeding back, I can just turn down the high frequency control on that particular channel. However, that's gonna turn down all the high frequencies above a certain amount, and that's gonna have quite a big impact on the way that microphone sounds. Now we will look at how to connect an outboard graphic EQ, such as this one, into our system in a future video, so keep posted for that. So, I hope you found this video useful. If it's helped you out at any of your gigs, please let me know in the comments down below. Don't forget to click to give the video a like and a thumbs up. Why not subscribe to the channel by clicking up here? You can watch one of our other videos by clicking over here, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>